So now we're thinking about physiological compensations after an acute hemorrhage. So what physiological compensations are likely to occur? Well, some of these are based on the fact that blood pressure equals cardiac output times peripheral resistance. I've written SVR there, systemic vascular resistance. That's actually the best term. Some people put TPR, total peripheral resistance. But it's the total resistance generated by the arterial system, particularly at the level of the arterioles, which are the most uh, constrictive part. So blood pressure is cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance. Cardiac output is how much heart the blood, how much blood the heart is pumping out in a one minute period. So at rest that might be something like five litres. So it's cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. And the cardiac output of the equation itself is actually explained that cardiac output equals the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume. So the heart rate is the number of times the heart is contracting in a one minute period. And the stroke volume is the volume of blood ejected per cardiac contraction. So for example, a low stroke volume, you wouldn't get much blood ejected per contraction. A high stroke volume, you get much more blood ejected per cardiac contraction. So blood pressure is cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. And cardiac output is heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. So we can see now that if there's a tachycardia, if there's an increase in the heart rate, that can compensate for a reduction in stroke volume. So if someone's been bleeding and the stroke volume is less, there's less blood coming back to the heart, then the heart can maintain a cardiac output, at least for a period of time, by beating faster. So it might like to beat at a reasonable rate with quite a high stroke volume, but if it can't, it can beat quicker with a smaller stroke volume to maintain cardiac output. And of course, if you maintain cardiac output, you're going to maintain blood pressure because blood pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. So the tachycardic response is to maintain cardiac output. But there's also an increase in systemic vascular resistance. So when the blood vessels are dilated, there's going to be a low vascular resistance, a low peripheral resistance. And when they're constricted, there's going to be a higher peripheral resistance. And the higher the peripheral resistance, the more the blood pressure is going to be maintained because blood pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. So there's going to be vasoconstriction. And that vasoconstriction is going to help maintain blood pressure. But there's vasoconstriction and that's going to reduce the blood supply to the skin so this patient feels cold. And the sympathetic stimulation which brings about that vasoconstriction can also cause sweating and make them feel clammy. Then there's reduced blood supply to the muscles and to the gastrointestinal tract. The reason is that the skin and the muscles and the gut can get by with a reduced blood supply for a period of time. It's kind of a buying time exercise. So vasoconstriction to those and that's going to leave more blood left over because the blood's not going around the skin. It's not going through the muscles as much. It's not going through the gut as much. So there's more blood left over to supply the kidneys, the heart and the brain, the essential core organs. So the peripheral vasoconstriction is going to A, maintain blood pressure and B, save precious blood for the perfusion of vital organs. And as well as that, the combination of the sympathetic response and the release of the catecholamines, as we've said, the adrenaline, the noradrenaline from the adrenal medulla, as well as causing a arterial constriction to increase or maintain the systemic blood pressure. Also, there's going to be a, a venoconstriction. Now the venoconstriction is very inconvenient from our point of view because it makes it very hard to get the cannulas in. That's why we should always cannulate early. 
So we could argue that from a clinical point of view, the arterial vasoconstriction is useful because we can recognise it, but the venoconstriction is inconvenient unless you've got your cannulas in at an early stage, in which case you can reperfuse the patient more, more rapidly and, and immediately. And the reason that there's a venoconstriction physiologically is the veins will get smaller. Now, actually, at any one time, the veins are partly dilated. At any one time, there's actually quite a large reserve of blood in the total venous system. Actually, you could say there's almost a few hundred mils of blood which is spare in the veins. It's just kind of circulating slowly. But if there's a venoconstriction, that blood gets back into the arterial circulation more quickly. Because what the venoconstriction is actually doing is increasing the venous return to the heart to maintain the venous return to the heart. And that's vital because via the Frank Starling reflex or some, what's called sometimes Starling's law of the heart, we know that blood pressure is dependent on venous return. Sorry, cardiac output is dependent on venous return and blood pressure is dependent on cardiac output. So we know that cardiac output is dependent on venous return. So if the venoconstriction can maintain the preload, can maintain the venous return, then the heart can pump out the blood which has been returned to it, and again, cardiac output can be maintained for a greater period of time. So knowing that blood pressure equals cardiac output multiplied by systemic vascular resistance goes quite a long way to explain these physiological compensations that we see as a result of an acute hemorrhage. Now, in the arch of the aorta, there are some barrow receptors. Barrow meaning pressure. And here we notice that the common carotid artery bifurcates into the external carotid artery here and the internal carotid artery here. And at the start of the internal carotid artery, there's a widened area called the carotid sinus. And the wall of the carotid sinus is particularly rich in barrow receptors. It detects the pressure of the blood. And this information about the blood pressure from the aortic arch is sent up via the vagus nerve to the medulla oblongata and from the carotid sinus in the first part of the internal carotid artery, it's sent up to the medulla oblongata in the brainstem via sensory branches of the glossopharyngeal nerve. This means the medulla oblongata is given second by second information about the blood pressure in the aortic arch and in the internal carotid arteries. Now, why do you imagine that there's so many barrow receptors in the start of the internal carotid artery? Well, this is probably because it's the internal carotid artery that's going to go through the base of the skull and is the main blood supply to the brain. So the brain is monitoring the pressure in the blood in the vessels which are supplying the brain itself with blood. Because obviously if the brain is hypoperfused for a period of time, that's got pretty serious consequences. So if the blood pressure is to fall, that's detected by the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata will increase sympathetic outflow and that will cause the vasoconstriction we've looked at, which will increase blood pressure. And it will also increase the heart rate, which will also increase blood pressure. And remember that blood pressure is cardiac output multiplied by peripheral resistance. So both of these sympathetic effects will increase blood pressure. In addition, this sympathetic outflow will go down to the adrenal gland, which is not on this diagram, but it will go down to the adrenal gland, specifically down to the adrenal medulla, and it will stimulate the release of the catecholamines, adrenaline and noradrenaline, which are also vasoconstricting and chronotropic. That is, they will increase 
heart rate. So blood pressure can be homeostatically maintained at least for a period of time. As we've seen on the section on the classification of hemorrhage.